we'll come back to the equine anatomy course. Um, we're continuing uh, talking about the anatomy of the equine abdomen after we talked about the head and the neck and uh, the um, uh, thorax. Um, we started on the equine abdomen in the past couple lectures and we've talked about uh, the muscles of the abdominal wall and the uh, deep fascia, the abdominal tunic, and the different surgical uh, yeah, approaches that we can do there, paralumbar fossa or the flank incisions, and then we moved and talked about uh, the different organs in the abdominal cavity, and we said that the majority of these uh, organs uh, consist of the gastrointestinal tract. We know what's on the left and what's on the right hand side of the abdominal cavity. And um, we reached uh, last time a point where we need to talk about one of the very um, common or frequently uh, seen diseases in, in the equine abdomen, and that is uh, colic. Diagnosing colic as an, in any clinical case, you have to have a complete case history. You have to realize the signs. I'm going to show you a number of signs that correspond with, with equine colic. And then we have to do a complete physical exam. Again, we're going to utilize anatomy to see how we're going to do the complete the physical exam of the, of the horse. And then we have to do a complete colic workout. Work, work out. and, and we will see how, again, anatomy will play a, a major role in and listening to the um, to the different gut parts and how to do rectal palpations how to examine the abdominal fluid and what kind of abdominal fluids we're looking at where where is the landmark to do to do a um, abdominal synthesis and things like that and then finally we'll talk about radiology and ultrasound um you know as as diagnostic modality to uh, you know to see um defects in in the gastrointestinal tract basically so 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 let's start by okay we we have we have a horse that 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 have been colicking for for a while and we will see some of these or all of these clinical signs one of the others or either some of them or all of them you will see you know clinical signs such as restlessness uh, the horse is restless he cannot stand still cannot it's not happy it moves up and down uh, have head pressing toward the you know the, the the walls of the stall and things like that looking at the flank the horse is continuously looking at the flank because it's painful and and you know the, the animal cannot talk but it can show you signs that basically will will uh, uh, you know indicate what's what's wrong there's something uh, in the abdominal cavity that's not going well Another sign is uh, uh, sweating and stretching. Um, you can you can you can see from this slide that the that the, uh, that the animal is um, uh, stretching its abdominal uh, wall, basically to, to 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 be more comfortable. Uh, you know to to give to give 
a chance for the gastrointestinal tract to to basically stretch out and and um, to reduce the pain, which which is not you know does not always work, you know, and um, you know kicking uh, because again the case is is pretty painful. Horses tend to have it or have a tendency to to start kicking again because it's painful. Sweating uh, the horses, uh, you you will see a colicky horse that sweats a lot, and that's 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 very important to to uh, you know to pay to pay attention to. So so these are some of the clinical signs that you might may see um, in a colicky horse. Now after the you know you you recognize these these uh, signs or symptoms, what you you should have to do is you have to do a complete uh, physical exam. So you receive the animal and, and in your clinic, or you go to the to the to the field, the farm, farm call, and and okay, well, the first thing you have to 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 look at the animal to see the signs, and then you know put your stethoscope and start uh, listening to the heart and to the lung, and we all remember the triangle, the auscultation triangle for both the heart and the lung on both the la left and the right hand side of the thoracic wall remember those those landmarks caudal to the long head of the triceps and along the um, the from the olecranon process to the um, to the uh, tuber coxy and a line connecting the tuber coxy to the um, uh, caudal um, end of the long head of the triceps along the mus muscles of the back or the back muscles all of this you know the basal border of the lung 6 11 16 uh, intercostal space and things like that and the second to sixth uh, intercostal spaces to us called the heart and um, all of all of this we need to to understand it and and, and perform it well and um, another thing is we have to to uh, you know measure the pulse of the um, of the animal remember the facial the facial artery you you have to to uh, Remember that you have to look also at the sclera and see the mucous membranes and see if they are, um, you know, if they have different colors, if they are ecteric, if they are cyanotic, um, you know, either either um, dark in color or pale in color versus the normal. Similar to these slides, the, the gum, you need to look at them and see this is a normal, nice pink uh, gum right here. Versus this one is pretty cyanotic, cyanotic, pretty pretty dark in color. It means there's there's toxins going on. There's a, 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 a compromise of the cardiovascular system. Here you can see that the gums are pretty pretty pale uh, and ecteric, which means that again there's some something that is that is really wrong in in here. We have. We have also something to to um, to assess the um, uh, status of the cardiovascular system, and we call that capillary refill time. Capillary refill time is basically pressing on on the on the gum here and see how long does it take for for the the gum to come back to its normal color. It's about a couple seconds usually. Uh, if if it stays more than that, that means you know you you have a problem. Um, of course, when you do the auscultation, you have to auscult the gastrointestinal tract, which is the main problem, because the gastrointestinal tract occupies the majority of the gastro of the of the abdominal cavity. Therefore, you have to auscult the gastrointestinal tract. Abdominal auscultation. This is this is a picture that's that's taken on the uh, left hand side of the um, of the animal. You can see where the you can see gut sounds along this this area. Which basically, which basically uh, uh, indicate that we have to understand and learn and, and, and memorize what are the structures on the left-hand side of the abdominal wall that can be uh, listened to. Uh, for example, you have the left ventral and dorsal colons. Um, this is very important. Also, the pelvic flexure. You can listen to these to the gut sounds in, in that area versus. The uh, right hand side, you will you will be listening to basically the the, uh, the cecum for for the major uh, for the major uh, part. That's that's very important to to uh, to remember. So you have to ascult all of all of this all of this area. 
sometimes even uh, maybe the the uh, uh, right uh, ventral colon uh, sometimes you can can listen to but but mainly the the um, the gut sounds and the uh, cecum on the right hand side and and the left and and left ventral and dorsal colons on the left hand side um, one of the procedures that we need to remember is to do a gastric reflux to basically uh, intubate the horse if you will so pass a, a um, nasogastric tube all the way to the stomach and and try and see or get some of the stomach contents so you can you can uh, test it to see if they are acidic hyperacidic alkalytic things like that to tell you basically what's the status of the uh, um, of the um, uh, a gastrointestinal tract, especially the stomach and the upper intestine. And here we have to remember how to do the nasogastric intubation. Uh, block the false nostril. Insert the uh, the uh, tube in the in the uh, uh, common nasal meatus ventrally in the true nostril. Uh, pass it all the way to the uh, epiglottis. Uh, do a reflux, uh, swallowing reflux, so so the animal can swallow and the uh, the epiglottis can go down. So, uh, or, or dorsally, I should say, uh, to, to block the trachea so the oropharynx is open and then you can pass the, um, the, um, uh, nasogastric tube, uh, easily. And then we have to look at the left hand side of the, of the neck to look at the tube going in and then go all the way until we reach the, the 11th intercostal space, which basically, um, uh, uh, indicates that we indicates that we reach the um, the um, uh, lower esophageal sphincter or the cardiac sphincter. After that, we we know that at that level we have an an acute angle. That for that we have to do another um, swallowing reflex so the cardiac can open, the cardiac sphincter can open, and we have to twist the the, the tube so we can we can pass it to the stomach because we have to overcome the uh, the acute angle all of this all of this we've mentioned it before and now i'm mentioning it mention mentioning it again here so you can you can realize how important this stuff is um after after we do the the, the gastric reflux we we have to do what we call abdominal synthesis we have to see what the 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 the, the type of fluids in the abdominal cavity and the landmark for that is, is basically um, to collect abdominal fluid or peritoneal fluid. We have to go about about 10 centimeters caudal to the xiphoid cartilage on the ventral midline. Caudal to the xiphoid cartilage on the ventral midline. About 10 centimeters caudal to the xiphoid cartilage on the ventral midline. Now we have to clean and prep the area surgically. Uh, clip it and prep it with betadine uh, three times alternatively and then after that, we have to put the needle again, uh, uh, clear and and, uh, and, um, and and pretty sterile into the peritoneal uh, into the peritoneal uh, cavity. Then we can collect the fluid. We have to be very careful not to injure any of the a uh, any of the small blood vessels in the subcutaneous fascia here, because sometimes it will contaminate the the um, the uh, sample that we're going to be collecting. In addition to that, we have to be very careful not to insert the needle pretty, um, you know, pretty deeply because sometimes you can go into the inside of the um, of the uh, intestine, and then you you you're going to be collecting uh, uh, lots of of uh, of ingesta, and so that will also contaminate the the um, uh, the um, uh, the sample that we're going to be collecting, uh, so we don't have to be uh, too deep, too, in, in, especially in in um, you know overweight horses or pregnant uh, mares, we have to be very careful because the amount of fat is going to be is going to be high, and so we have to make sure that we are not in that fat. We have to get into the cavity, and and we can feel that it 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 feels it feels like a a, a, a very gentle pop, if you will. You you will feel that when, when, with practice you will you will feel that uh, very very gentle and it's kind of uh, uh, once you feel that you know that you are in the peritoneal uh, cavity collecting collecting the uh, the fluid 
the abdominal fluid or the peritoneal fluid. This is basically the, the way we're going to collect the, um, the um, uh, samples, of course, on the left-hand side picture. You can see a nice yellow color, uh, clear in a normal, in a normal horse uh, for the peritoneal fluid. However, in the, in the right-hand side picture, you can see that it is reddish and, and it, it, it's either contaminated or there is really some blood in the peritoneal cavity. And the way we know that is basically to centrifuge this, uh, this sample and see if the, if the red blood cells are fresh or if they are not fresh. If they are fresh, that means you, you contaminated the sample. If they, if they're not fresh, then they've been there for a little while. That means there is a problem that, you know, led to, to bleeding inside the abdominal cavity. So we have to, to kind of distinguish between the, these two cases. But the most important case or, or thing to remember is the fact that the way to do abdominocentesis is 10 centimeters caudal to the xiphoid cartilage on the ventral midline. Ventral midline on the linea alba. You have to insert the needle. The needle should go through the linea, linea alba all the way to the abdominal cavity. It's pretty important. Now after that comes a very important thing and that is a rectal palpation. Rectal palpation is extremely important in, in horses and must be done pretty carefully. So must be done also, uh, you, you, you know, with, with an experienced person. Experienced person, somebody who did, who did it uh, uh, before uh, a number of times, um, you have to, to do a lot of lubrication, if you will, lots of uh, KY jelly, if you will, lots of it, and then, and then, or, e or even, even even oil, just just pour some oil on uh, the rectal sleeve all the way from your tip of your fingers all the way to your shoulder. Just lots of fluid, uh, lots of oil, lots of oil. And in addition to that, sometimes some of the some of the clinicians they they mix they mix it with with lidocaine just to to kind of you know relax the the uh, the rectum a little bit, local anesthesia if you will, to 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 make make the rectum a little relaxed. So you can you can pass your hand, um, you know, easier, uh, easier than than you know without anesthesia. Some people do it. Some some clinicians don't. That's 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 a person's uh, preference. It is always prefer preferable to to mix it with with uh, with some with some uh, lidocaine or you know any local anesthetic available basically. Now now. The, the most important thing from an anatomical standpoint is what are you going to palpate on the left hand side and what you are going to palpate on the right hand side of the abdominal wall or on the abdominal cavity. This is very important because any change in this will be considered colic. So the normal structures that you're going to be palpating on the left hand side of the abdominal cavity are The left kidney, the edge of the left kidney. You will also feel the edge of the spleen. You will feel the pelvic flexure. The pelvic flexure. The left ventral and the left dorsal colons. In addition to that, you must feel the nephrosplenic area. So you have to feel the nephrosplenic ligament first, and then you have to put your hand in the area that is formed between the nephrosplenic ligament, the left kidney, the spleen, and the dorsal abdominal cavity. This space must be free and clear, otherwise you have the risk of nephrosplenic entrapment, as we've mentioned earlier. Remember that. So the nephrosplenic area must be palpated and must be cleaned, clear, empty of any structures. The nephrosplenic ligament must be palpated. The left kidney must be palpated. The edge of the spleen must be palpated. The pelvic flexure must be palpated. The left ventral and the left dorsal colons must be palpated. 
in on the left hand side of the abdominal cavity in the normal horse in the normal horse this must be remembered now we go to the right hand side we go to the right hand side of the abdominal cavity and we have to feel again normal horse we have to feel the base of the cecum and the bundle that contains the cranial mesentric artery and the cecrocolic arteries at the base of the cecum and some jejunum you have to feel those you cannot feel the kidney the right kidney because it's way cranially so cannot be palpated rectally main thing is you have to feel the base of the cecum you have to feel some jejunum and you have to feel the bundle that contains mainly the cranial mesentric artery remember we talked about parasites the strongulus if pounding pulse is found there there is a problem if you don't feel the 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 um, the jejunum in there that's a problem that means they might be entrapped in the epiploic foramen that's very important or in the inguinal area again all of this must be palpated in the normal animal if there is any problem that means you have colic let's see again what are the structures on the right hand side we have to feel the cecum cranial mesentric artery and cecrocolic arteries now the duodenum can be felt if it is distended and i mentioned one case for distension of the duodenum and that case is anterior enteritis if you remember last time i talked about anterior enteritis and how that wall of the duodenum is thickened from two to three millimeter thickness in the normal animal into seven to eight millimeter thick in the in the ultrasound um, image in the in the animals that have uh, anterior enteritis so be careful duodenum is not always is not always palpate palpable rectally unless again i repeat it unless there is distension in it one case that causes distension in the duodenum is anterior enteritis now on the left hand side on the left hand side of the a um, uh, animal we will feel i mentioned the spleen left kidney nephrosplenic ligament small colon large colon pelvic uh, uh, pelvic flexure which is the connection between the left ventral and the left dorsal colons. These structures must be remembered. So, on the left hand side, again, spleen, left kidney, pelvic flexure, left and, and, and uh, left ventral and dorsal colons, and also small colon here. We can know it because it's full of fecal balls and it's also saculated. Also, as I mentioned earlier, we have to feel the empty nephrosplenic area. So the nephrosplenic ligament must be palpated. If that area is empty, that's good. If it's not, then that's a problem. This is the right hand side again. We can we can feel the base of the cecum. Again, the duodenum is here, but only we can feel it if it's distended. And the cranial mesentric artery, the cranial mesentric artery at the base of the cecum, and also some jejunum here. This is on the right hand side of the animal. Now, if we want to uh, further diagnose can we can if we if we want to further diagnose uh, uh, abdominal problems we can utilize ultrasound it is it's been it's been used and, and and very effective 
to show you basically the different structures and how they can uh, be uh, uh, misplaced, if you will, in the, in the abdominal cavity. Look at the following image, please. So, so this is an ultrasound image. Um, as, as you can see uh, in, the, in the upper pictures, you will see the left-hand side of the abdominal cavity, and this is the right-hand side of the abdominal cavity. So this is the right abdominal cavity, the right wall, and this is the left wall. This, on the left wall, we have the left kidney, we have the spleen, and we have the little thing here that's called the nephrosplenic ligament. So we are, this is the left hand side here, this is the right hand side here. And on the left hand side, we have the left ventral and the left dorsal colons. Left ventral and the left dorsal colons. Sometimes, and this is the probe for the ultrasound right here. Sometimes if we, if we put the probe here, we, well, we have to find both of them. We have to, to look at both of them and, and, and find them. If we don't, if we find twisting on that, on that, um, uh, 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 dorsal, uh, left dorsal colon, uh, depending on the degree, like this is a 90 degree from the original, uh, position, this is 180. So, so the, the left dorsal colon, turned all the way 180 degrees here it turned about 270 degrees and here it turned 360 degrees now with this you can see it pretty clearly with the ultrasound and that case is called do colon displacement colon di displacement colon displacement very painful uh, uh, case and it requires surgery uh, uh, immediately so you can fix the twist that that happened in the in the between the the the, the left ventral and the left dorsal columns here so you have to untwist it immediately and hope that you you actually receive the animal uh, pretty uh, early uh, because if if it continues for a longer time blood supply will be cut on this air to, on on these areas and and devastating outcomes can can happen even that can lead to death because part of the intestine is dead because there's no blood supply to that. So we have to, to be uh, very careful about that. Now, now the, the, when, when we do the rectal palpation and things like that, it's a very important thing that I would like to mention, and that is the possibility of rectal tears. Rectal tears is basically rupturing one or more layers of the rectum. You've seen this slide before. During rectal palpation, the examiner basically will have a sleeve after they're done, something like that. This is this is a little more um, um, more devastating. It, it doesn't have to be like this. It can be less than that, and we we will know how it's going to be less than that. But but there are a number of things that I would like to mention about rectal tears. First, it's it's one of the highest liability cases for veterinarians it's pretty pretty important to to make sure that you know you know what you're doing before you uh, you know you you do your rectal exam that's that's very important because this can can take you to court if if you don't know what you're doing and you ruptured the the rectum the second thing i would like to mention is that this case if it happened um th this is an emergency we have to treat it like an emergency meaning that the owner needs to be notified immediately and uh, action needs to be to be to be done uh, you know on the spot because you don't want especially if the case is pretty advanced uh, you don't want the the uh, um, the 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 feces to get into the the peritoneal cavity and and, and cause disasters and peritonitis and, and possibly death uh, then we have to do the, we have to assess the location of the uh, of the rectal tear. Where did it happen in the in the rectum or in the in the gastrointestinal tract? Because depending on the location, that's where we're going to do the the treatment. And we have to assess it. We have to assess how bad the the uh, the um, the lesion is, how bad the the tear uh, is, 
so so we have to to go with classifying the the rectal tear and there is a, a, a classification for rectal tears this is from a paper that I, I we, we published uh, when I was at Purdue um, with with uh, with Steve Adams and and uh, Augie Peter. Uh, uh, th this this is basically the four stages of uh, rectal tears. So in A here you have the mucosa only. That's a stage one. Stage two you have a mucosa and submucosa torn here. Uh, mucosa, submucosa, and muscularis. This is a stage of three, and stage four, which is the disaster, is the is when you have ruptured all layers of the uh, of the of the rectum. Um, so, so in order to, to to fix that, again, depending on the on the lesion, but I'm going to mention a couple of a uh, couple of uh, uh, things here. Uh, uh, first thing, we have a rectal sleeve that you can actually uh, insert it there, and when you invert it, you 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 kind of uh, create a, a, a layer to protect the tear until it it uh, it heals, if you will, and the feces will will pass through this um, uh, plastic um, uh, sleeve, if you will. Uh, that that can that can be done in the most in the well in the in the more devastating cases. Uh, you will have, uh, you know, uh, surgeries like loop colostomy. Loop colostomy, the, the one that I mentioned again earlier when we talked about the flank region, it's basically deviating the the uh, uh, path of feces. And instead of going through the rectum, now the feces is going to go through the abdominal wall. So you you will attach part of the of the colon to the abdominal wall. And make the opening um, so so the, the 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 horse can defecate from from this opening so that the rectum is basically um, uh, closed at this point. So these are the two 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 of two of the treatment options for rectal tears. But again, uh, the main thing here is to understand that this is a flank incision to do the lobe colostomy, and and uh, we have to classify the tear. Um, stage one through four, depending on how many how many layers were were basically affected. Um, um, this is this is basically the extent of of the rectal tears that I would like to talk uh, about. Next topic, I will talk about the abdominal surgery. Now you have reached a decision that okay, we're gonna do we're gonna put the horse on the table. We're gonna do abdominal surgery. How are we gonna do it? And what should we learn uh, to to help us do the surgery uh, appropriately, if you will? Again, I am focusing on the anatomy. I am not focusing on the clinics. I'm focusing on the anatomical structures, so you can remember it when you get to medicine and surgery later on. So this is basically what you need to. This is the foundation, and then when you get it in medicine and surgery, definitely you will uh, uh, talk about. Um, uh, you know more more advanced techniques and more detailed techniques, but this is just to give you a pretty uh, uh, basic and foundational ideas about about the topic. So ventral midline ciliotomy is the most common way of opening the abdominal uh, cavity, and we will talk about that next time.